Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. Today I want to tell you about one of the most interesting experiments ever done by one of the founders of modern chemistry, Antoine Lavoisier. Along the way, we'll learn about energy and the way that heat works, and it'll also give us a chance to talk a little about the ethics behind animal research. Let's start by talking a little bit more about energy. In the last video, I mentioned the first law of thermodynamics. This is a rule that says that, in a closed system, the total amount of energy is always conserved, and it turns out to be a really useful concept when we're looking at the energy involved in a chemical reaction. For example, suppose we have a generic chemical reaction in which we start with some reactants and we make products. The molecules themselves have a certain amount of energy. That can be because of potential energy, such as the strength of the bonds between the atoms, or because the molecules rotate or because the atoms in the molecules themselves are vibrating. Almost all molecules have a combination of these kinds of energy. Now, suppose the product molecules have less of this energy overall than the reactants. That means we lose energy during the reaction. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that the total energy is conserved. So what happened to the energy that the molecules lost? Usually, that excess energy is given off as heat or light, like in this combustion reaction. In this case, the product molecules have a lower potential energy than the reactants, and the energy we lose is coming off as heat and light. This kind of reaction, where the energy is decreasing, is called an exothermic reaction. It's often easy to recognize exothermic reactions because they usually give off heat or light. The opposite is true in cases where potential energy increases. In that case, the chemical reaction must absorb energy. In that case, the reaction will seem to become colder. For instance, here's a reaction in which two solids dissolve and the temperature goes down. This seems like the opposite of what you'd expect. If the energy of the products is higher, why is it getting colder? The important thing to remember is that the reaction is absorbing heat from the material around it. That means the beaker and the solvent in the beaker get colder, while the potential energy of the chemicals in the reaction are going up. Reactions like that, where the potential energy is increasing, are called endothermic. Exothermic reactions, the ones that release energy, are more familiar to most people. Anytime you burn something, you're performing an exothermic reaction. But you've probably seen endothermic reactions, too. If you've ever had an injury, like a sprained ankle, you might have used a cold pack to keep the swelling down. Some cold packs are actually stored at room temperature, and when you want to use them, you squeeze the bag, and it suddenly becomes icy cold. That's because squeezing the bag starts an endothermic chemical reaction inside, so the reaction absorbs energy from the material in the bag, making the bag get colder. If you want to know how much energy you can get out of an exothermic reaction, or how much energy will be absorbed by an endothermic reaction, you need to perform some careful experiments. In our class, we'll measure the temperature of some reactions, but that doesn't actually tell us the energy. Instead, it tells us a property called the enthalpy, which has the symbol H. If you wanted to actually find the energy instead of the enthalpy, you'd have to perform your experiment in a sealed container so that the volume would stay constant. That's something we'll do in the physical chemistry course, and I hope you'll take that class someday. But in general chemistry, we usually do experiments in a beaker or flask that's open to the air, so the volume in the container isn't constant. Instead, it's the pressure that's constant, because the pressure in the beaker is just whatever the room pressure is. In experiments like that, what we're measuring is H, the enthalpy, not the energy. To be exact, what we're measuring is delta H. The Greek letter delta means change, so we measure the change in the enthalpy. Here's a simple equation for that. The change in enthalpy is just the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. So, if our reaction is exothermic, that means the products have a lower enthalpy than the reactants, so we'll get a negative number for delta H. If our reaction is endothermic, the products have a higher enthalpy, so we get a positive delta H. But how do we measure this? 
The device we use is called a calorimeter. The very first calorimeter was invented by Antoine Lavoisier and Pierre Simon Laplace. We've mentioned Lavoisier before, and the experiments he performed with calorimeters are some of the most interesting ones he did. I mentioned in an earlier video that Lavoisier was interested in improving farming practices in 18th century France. One of the things he studied was how efficient different kinds of livestock feed are. If you have several different types of grain you could feed your cows, which ones would give your cows the most energy? Here's how he did that experiment. This is a picture of the calorimeter Lavoisier and Laplace invented. You can see in this cutaway that there are three chambers, one inside the other. The outer chamber was filled with a mixture of water and ice. The reason for that is that, as you might know, ice melts into water at exactly zero degrees Celsius. So if that outer chamber contains a mixture of both water and ice, it should always be the same temperature, zero degrees. That means that even if the temperature in the room goes up and down, the outer chamber will stay at zero, and that'll insulate the inner chambers from sudden changes in the room temperature. The middle chamber was filled with ice, but it's the central chamber where the interesting stuff happens. Lavoisier would put a guinea pig in that chamber and then put on the lid. The body heat of the guinea pig would warm up the ice in the middle chamber so that some of it would melt. After a certain period of time, they would take the guinea pig out and put it back in its home, and they'd drain out the water from the melted ice in the middle chamber. The higher the guinea pig's metabolism, the more body heat it would produce, and therefore the more ice would melt. In the next part of the experiment, Lavoisier would feed the guinea pig some livestock feed, and then put it back in the calorimeter again, and determine how much ice would melt. In this way, he could compare the amount of ice that would melt for each type of livestock feed that the guinea pig could eat. They predicted that when more ice melted, that meant that the feed that the guinea pig ate must have given it more metabolic energy. Today we know a lot more about how metabolism works, and we would now say that this experiment really isn't the best way to determine the energy content of food. In fact, we'll talk about a much better way in a couple of videos. Still, this was a pretty well-designed experiment based on what they knew about biology and chemistry at the time. Before we use what Lavoisier and Laplace discovered, this is a good time to mention the brave little guinea pigs that helped out in this experiment. In this case, none of those guinea pigs were killed during the research, and the only harm they suffered was being stuck in that chilly calorimeter for a while. But of course, some medical and scientific research does involve animals, and sometimes the animals do die, especially in the course of medical research into new disease treatments or the safety of pharmaceuticals. If you ever become a research scientist, it's important to think carefully about issues of animal welfare and research ethics. Different people have different opinions on whether new disease treatments that might save many human lives justify harming animals during the research that led to those treatments. I hope you'll have an opportunity to take a course in scientific ethics, because whatever your opinion on animal research, it's important to understand and think through issues like these. So back to the calorimetry. In experiments where the pressure is constant, the change in enthalpy is the same as the change in heat. The research of Lavoisier and Laplace eventually led them to realize that if you want to know how much energy it takes to heat an object, there are really only three things that matter. So for instance, suppose you wanted to heat a block of metal. The first thing that matters is the mass. This makes sense. If you had a 10 gram piece of metal and a 5 gram piece of the same metal, it would take twice as much heat to warm up the 10 gram piece because there's twice as much of the metal. The second thing to consider is what exactly the object is made of. Imagine that you're cooking soup and you had a big pot of it on your stove. You left the stirring spoon in the boiling water for several minutes. Would you be afraid to grab the spoon and start stirring it? Chances are it would depend on what the spoon is made of. If it's a copper spoon, you might not want to touch it with your bare hands because you know the spoon is likely to be very hot. But if it were a wooden spoon, you might feel it's safe to grab it. And you'd be right. It's easier to heat up some materials than it is to heat up others. 
In comparison to copper, wood is very difficult to heat to a high temperature. This property is called the specific heat capacity, which has the symbol C. Here's a table of the specific heat capacities of several different materials. As you can see, most metals have a very low specific heat capacity. That means it doesn't take much energy to cause them to become hot. On the other hand, materials like wood, plastic, and water have much higher specific heat capacities, which means it takes a lot of energy to raise their temperature. That's why you feel safe touching the wooden spoon. Even if you've never heard of specific heat capacity, you know from experience that a wooden spoon is unlikely to be too hot to touch. This also explains why it usually takes a long time to boil water. As you can see, water has an unusually high specific heat capacity. There really aren't very many common liquids that have a specific heat capacity as high as that of water. That makes water especially difficult to heat. It's also one reason why cities that are near the ocean tend to have milder winters and summers. It takes a long time for the temperature of the ocean water to change from one season to the next, and that helps stabilize the temperature in the whole area. Before we move on, notice the units of the specific heat capacity. Joules per gram degree Celsius. That means that, for example, it takes 0.412 joules of heat to raise the temperature of one gram of iron by one degree Celsius. In comparison, it only takes 0.129 joules of heat to raise the temperature of a gram of lead by one degree. So, if we start heating both of them at the same time, the lead will get hotter faster. The last thing that matters when determining how much heat it takes to warm an object is how much we want the temperature to change. That makes good sense. If we want to change the temperature by 10 degrees, it'll take twice as much heat than if we only want to change the temperature by 5 degrees. So to sum up, the change in enthalpy when we heat or cool an object will depend on the mass, the specific heat capacity, and the change in the temperature. And here's an equation that sums all that up. Notice that we need to be careful with our units. The specific heat capacity is measured in joules per gram degree Celsius, and the enthalpy is measured in units of joules. In order for the units to work out, the mass must be measured in grams, and the temperature change needs to be in Celsius. Let's use this equation to try to solve a few problems. Suppose we have a 50 gram sample of water at 25 degrees Celsius. If we add 10.0 kilojoules of heat, what will be the final temperature of the water? We'll use the equation that we just looked at for this problem. We're trying to find out the final temperature, so we'll need to find delta T. That means we need to know delta H, M, and C. Delta H is the change in the enthalpy. And as I mentioned, that's the same as the change in heat for experiments like this where the pressure is constant. So that's 10.0 kilojoules. Don't forget that we need the units to work out, so we need delta H to be in joules. A kilojoule is 1,000 joules, so in this example we have 10,000 joules. The mass is 50.0 grams. To get the specific heat capacity, we need to look at that table that we saw earlier. This tells us that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.181 joules per gram degree Celsius. When we put these values into the equation and solve for delta T, we get 47.8 degrees. However, notice that's not our final answer. The question asked what the final temperature is, but what we just found was delta T, the change in temperature. Our water started at 25.0 degrees, and we just found out that the temperature change was 47.8. So the final temperature will be 72.8 degrees C. Notice our answer for delta T had three significant figures in it. 
Remember, using the correct number of sig figs is always worth points in my classes, so you may want to look at earlier videos where we discuss sig figs if you've forgotten how to do it. Let's try another problem. Suppose we have a 5.00 gram piece of metal at 25.0 degrees C. We add 100 joules of heat and find that the temperature increases to 77.0 degrees. What kind of metal is it? This problem shows us one way that we could identify an unknown metal. Every metal has a different ability to absorb heat. You might remember that's what the specific heat capacity is telling us. So we'll use our equation again, and this time we want to solve for the specific heat capacity. We know that we added 100 joules of heat, so that's delta H. And we know that the mass is 5.00 grams. Our temperature went from 25.0 to 77.0 degrees. So delta T is 52.0 degrees Celsius. If we now solve for the specific heat capacity, we find that it's 0 0.385 joules per gram degrees C. If we look at our table of specific heat capacities, we'll find out that this metal is probably copper. I should mention that I don't expect you to memorize this table of specific heat capacities. I'll give you this data when you need it on a test or a quiz, and our textbook also has it if you need it for homework problems. That's enough new material for now. Next time, we'll talk more about enthalpy, and we'll start using what we just learned to talk about the enthalpies of chemical reactions, rather than just heating or cooling pieces of metal. So, until next time, have a good week!